So to keep you guys going and excited, we're going to talk about programmable thermostats. <laughs> um, here you go. Uh, so really, I mean, Olia and I are going to talk today. My name's first, but that's only because I'm speaking first. This is a project which Olia really conceived and led, and I think it's really, really interesting in terms of uh, some examples of hypotheses which can really have you know, the potential to have real energy savings, but what's the real world reality? And how do you go about testing that and finding out you know, what, what truly is? Um, oh, I guess, you know. So I thought, thought, I, thought I'd just give a really quick overview of Fraunhofer, because a lot of organizations here are doing property management, real estate development, things like that. We come from a different uh, point of view. Fraunhofer is a applied, thank you, an applied research and development organization, uh, not for profit. We do contract research and development for industry in particular, but also for government. And we work in a few different areas. The largest activity, the one I lead and the one that Olya works in, is in building energy efficiency. And in this area, we do a variety of different kinds of things in buildings. Oh, did I hit the, uh-oh. I think I hit the wrong button. I'll hit it again. Oh, thank goodness. Um, <laughs> in building energy efficiency, we work in two main areas right now. Um, one is building enclosures, so that's walls, roof, windows, things like that. How to make them uh, particularly more effective, efficient, sustainable, durable, particularly in retrofit type of applications. The other area that we work in right now to a large extent, and this is the focus of our discussion today, is that of residential energy management. This is a more of an emerging area which is enabled by access to real-time or close-time real-time electricity data from smart meters, uh, low-cost computing capabilities which are going into more and more devices, pervasive communications, pervasive sensing which enables you to do things like home energy displays, a variety of home automation techniques, and a lot of the questions are, how can you really t use this to effectively and persistently save energy in homes? And one of the devices that we looked at as part of this is the, is the thermostat. Um, in terms of the range of things we do, we do a lot of different activities. We do research where we do help develop products, apply new materials. We also do field testing to validate how things perform. And that's really what I'm going to focus, our, our discussion is going to focus in on today is with programmable thermostats, how do they actually perform in the field and do programmable thermostats, does the usability of those programmable thermostats really result in, a, does a more usable thermostat really affect the energy savings potential of those devices? So after the, given this intro, Olya. Before I tell you about our project, um, I'd like to describe um, the context and history that led up to it. And it's pretty rich and dramatic as far as such things go. Um, then after um, I tell you about this, um, I'll try to kind of, um, I'll, I'll present you the results, uh, describe the project itself. And then uh, I think what's also going to be interesting for the audience here, considering people are so interested in behavior, I'll try to put it in the perspective in the context of our behavior change model to see what it all means. So now I guess I need that. Okay. Um, so we wouldn't be talking about programmable thermostats here if they didn't have a large energy saving potential. And um, they do, potentially. <laughs> so heating and cooling consumes a lot of energy. And we know that um, there's a rule of, a rule of thumb that by, uh, for each uh, degree of reduction uh, for set point, set point temperature, there's a 3% reduction for energy use. Um, finally, um, unlike some new home energy management technologies, programmable thermostats are ubiquitous. Almost everybody has either, um, either manual, say, or, or programmable thermostats. Um, that is, if people really understand what programmable thermostats are. And that's where the, actually the problems begin. A lot of people don't even know what that means if, um, when surveys are conducted for, um, say, the residential uh, energy consumption survey. Uh, responses change whether people have thermostat or not, uh, depending on how you describe it, because that's not clear to everybody. 
So whether we like it or not, um, thermostat effectiveness depends on home occupant behavior. And people have to program them uh, to achieve energy, saving, uh, energy savings. And we all know that programming thermostats is complicated. It's complicated even for comfort, but it's even more complicated uh, for energy savings. There is a variety of programs. There are weekday programs, weekend programs, seven-day programs, vacation programs. We all know, uh, due to research from Ellen Meyer, that um, people don't understand the abbreviations, the buttons are small, uh, the fonts are small, the, um, the, the symbols and lights are really confusing to people, and that's just part of it. You know, the second big component is that uh, it's more kind of cognitive and conceptual, is that uh, people have a lot of misconceptions about energy and thermostats. Um, so a lot of them think that heating all the time is more efficient than turning thermostat on uh, off. Uh, that they also think that it's just a simple on-off switch. Or there's also another common misconception that people tend to talk about a lot is that they think that um, the, the higher they crank up the temperature, the faster, say, the, the building heats up. And those misconceptions uh, are held by people who are not necessarily stupid. I mean, there are educated people who have this beliefs, and some of them are even engineers, oh my god. So, <laughs> um, so, so what happened is that um, the nice and clear picture that was originally um, that originally existed um, that allowed um, EPA to develop energy star program for programmable thermostats has become really messy due to occupant behavior coming into the picture. So there were some studies that found um, that programmable thermostats saved energy, which was encouraging. Um, however, there were also studies that found that they didn't save energy. And one thing to keep in mind is the methodology that was used by those studies is largely relying on um, in the best case scenario, it's billing, uh, billing analysis. So you know, say, the gas consumption, if it's gas-based heating. Um, in most cases, it's surveys, telephone surveys, so paper surveys. So we are relying there largely on self-reports. And we know in many cases, self-reports are not necessarily the most reliable thing to base our policy decisions on. Um, so in fact, the picture became so messy uh, for programmable thermostats that in 2009 EPA discontinued uh, its energy star program and decided to evaluate more uh, the effectiveness of thermostats for energy saving. Um, since then, the focus has shifted largely to thermostat usability, which is very helpful. Um, we all kind of intuitively see that there is a problem with usability. And the main assumption uh, behind this focus is that improved usability will facilitate um, uh, energy saving behavior by owners of programmable thermostats. And some of the main questions that are um, on the table right now, um, the first question is how to measure usability of programmable thermostats, and the second one, how usability affects use and adoption of, um, uh, adoption of thermostat energy saving features. So does it mean that if you have a programmable thermostat that's easy to use, you're going to actually use it for saving energy? So um, Ellen Meyer and colleagues at uh, LBNL, University of California, Davis, have gone a long way uh, to address some of these questions. And um, they have become pretty much champions for the cause, uh, as we know it. <laughs> um, so what they've done, they've conducted usability tests, very structured usability tests for some of the thermostats that are on the market right now. Here are some of the models that they've used. There are five models uh, with a range of types. You know, you see one of them is actually even internet-based thermostat. Some of them are touch screens, some of them are buttons. And um, so what they did, they had people come over into their lab um, and they had to do complete six tasks that all kind of zeroed in on the usability of each individual thermostat. And they video recorded them and I think many of us probably have seen that wonderful video <laughs> that Alan loves to show in his presentations where people just keep punching that thing and We're nothing. Not no, no, we just say. Yeah. So in their research, it became clear that thermostats, programmable thermostats, vary a lot. And some of them are much better than others. Uh, and some of them are much easier to use than others. And here you see, um, it's an excerpt from, from Alan's presentation. Um, 
uh, that's how their performance varies on some of the tasks. And th those are basic tasks, just turning them on and off, or figuring out this, um, if, uh, uh, what temperature it's set to, or identifying the temperature the device is, is set to reach. So um, those are basic things. You'd, you'd think that, you know, that should be, that, that should be easy. And for some thermostats, it's clearly not as easy as, as than for others. So some of the insights from, uh, from the testing that are particularly interesting for us is that um, touch screen interfaces uh, performed better than button interfaces. They are, they are easier to use. Uh, their best performing th uh, thermostat was the um, Echo B web um, that involved um, basically a web dashboard, uh, like, a, like a web planner, basically internet planner. And um, it's great, but to, to be able to use that, you have to assume, uh, first of all, it has complicated installation, and then um, it requires a Wi-Fi in the computer, which is considering the populations we're talking about here now is not necessarily given big assumptions to make um, that people are gonna have that. So, and the second best uh, was Honeywell Vision Pro that doesn't require internet access uh, or a computer. So that's one piece from their research that we took and kind of decided to run with it. So we love the research, and the reason we love the research that Alan um, has done um, with his group is that what we're interested in in the residential energy management activity at Fraunhofer is really the intersection between technology and behavior, and what better project can you possibly dream of than, than this? Technology and behavior is a really complicated test. <laughs> so, um, so we decided to take it a step further. And to see what happens if we investigate the impact of usability outside of the lab. So what happens if we test this with normal households, uh, normal homes? And um, so are people with a high usability thermostat more likely to use energy saving settings than people with a low usability thermostats? And luckily, um, US Department of Energy Building America program funded this project so we could satisfy our curiosity and, and test this question. Uh, but funding is not enough. And one of the biggest challenges for such uh, field test projects is finding the appropriate building. And that's where huge kudos to our partner, Wind Residential, that um, a new ecology that actually went through tons of buildings with us too, to find the appropriate one, because this is something that um, you have to iterate for a long time uh, to find really the right mix. <laughs> so. Um, Eventually, we ended up going with the Wind Residential building. Uh, it's an affordable housing building in Revere, Massachusetts. Um, the lucky thing there that, that, was, that made the whole thing easier for us is that the whole building was undergoing weatherization. So installation of something new like a thermostat wasn't necessarily gonna be, um, it's not gonna lead to Hawthorne effects. And I don't know if you know what the effect is, basically when people are aware that there's a study going on, they maybe behave differently than if um, they're not aware of that. So, and logistically also, we could kind of go on the tail of the weatherization crews and install the thermostats uh, without being very um, obvious to the residents because we wanted to have a very um, um, clean test just looking at usability. We didn't want to put any kind of other behavioral component on top of that, so what happens if you just look at usability as a factor without adding anything to it? Um, so another lucky, th aspect of this project is that we, um, again, due to cooperation and support from WIN and from the property management itself, um, we were able to use opt-out recruitment. And that is, I can't say enough of that, and that is crucial <laughs> to get uh, a good sample size. So what happened is we just uh, we contacted all the residents that we're going to be installing new thermostats. If you don't want this to happen, please sign this, bring it to the management office. And if we didn't receive their signed copy until a certain time, then they were going to get their new thermostats. So that is how we actually got a relatively large sample size, which is uncommon with such studies. Um, 83 out of 92 households decided to participate in the study. And um, at this point, we ended up with 63 valid data sets because of a lot of other issues that come on top of this, which I'll, I'll discuss <laughs> in the next slides. So, um, so what happened is that each participating household received um, either a high usability uh, touch screen thermostat or a low usability button interface thermostat. And their households were randomly assigned to those conditions. 
Um, on top of the thermostat, we installed uh, non-intrusive sensors to measure temperature inside each apartment, humidity, and the state of the furnace, if the furnace went on and off. And those measurements were taken every 10 minutes for the duration of the study. So this allowed us to look at the, what was happening inside each apartment and the best we could short of putting in video cameras. <laughs> Uh, because from the temperature, you get the relevant data on the use of thermostats. That's the assumption. And that's one, one part that we are really working on now, to get, to get the behavioral data from the temperature. Um, besides that, we did a traditional thing, which is we did a survey. We did a survey before, when we just installed the thermostats, we did a survey after. Um, um, of course, the return rates of service are not huge, um, but they, they're definitely helpful in some of the cases. Um, what we also did, we went there every week to meet gas, to read gas meters, to, um, to see what gas consumption resulted from, um, from the installation of the new thermostat. And here you see, uh, as a member of our installation crew, we have wonderful, talented interns who uh, did a lot of great work on the project, who went in there, and mostly females, which actually made um, the contact with residents much easier. And they were inspired, and they were kind of shocked to see that there was girls coming in to install the thermostat. <laughs> So that's definitely something we didn't expect, but it made, made it easier. Um, so here are the thermostats that we used. Um, the high usability, um, um, called Honeywell Vision Pro, we're going to refer to it as VP, like vice president of all <laughs> thermostats <laughs> in later discussions of that. Um, so it was number two, as I mentioned, from Ellen Meyer's lab testing. The second one is basic programmable thermostat. Um, we're, we're going to call it BA in the later analysis. And um, I think another interesting thing to look at here is the price difference. Um, one of them is definitely much more expensive than the other. Um, yeah, so they were similar in, uh, in the sense that they were both new. Uh, they looked nice. Actually, people who got the cheaper one were not necessarily upset about the fact that they didn't get their more expensive one. So that's something that we were really concerned about. They were made by the same manufacturer because we didn't want to compare really apples and oranges there. Um, and more importantly, they had the same default schedule. And when we installed them, we made sure that each thermostat is installed with that default schedule, which is an energy saving default schedule. So the temperature goes down from 70 to 62 degrees for the nighttime setback from 10 p.m. till 6 a.m. And it goes down for the daytime setback from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. So, um, so we installed the thermostats, and then um, now we can turn to some of our preliminary results. Uh, and because we wanted to, um, to find out if people with high usability thermostat end up um, using energy saving settings more, in this initial analysis, I have to say that we just, uh, end of March, beginning of April, we got the data. So, and there's a lot of data that we have. So we had to focus on something to, to share with you here. And what we really focused on is nighttime set setbacks. So uh, how many apartments, what was the likelihood of um, lowering the temperature for the night? Because if they lower the temperature for the night, that, that is, in a way, is a metric of energy saving behavior. So that's, uh, that's gonna be the focus of the results that we are, we're gonna be presenting here. So here, what you see is the mean uh, night temperature in apartments uh, by group. And the, the red, red crosses are Vision Pro, high usability. The blue crosses are basic, low usability. And there are two things uh, that are important to notice on the slide. The first one is that the average night temperature in apartments was much higher than the default setback. None of them come even close to the 62 temp uh, degrees. The second thing is that there is really no difference between the two. So, um, so that's the, those are the averages. Now we, just, we were thinking, maybe, um, maybe our results get skewed by some high values. Why don't we look at the minimum temperature? Here's the minimum nighttime temperatures in apartments. And nighttime is from midnight to 4 a.m. To 4 a.m., yeah. So this is a very strong test. It's not like we measured around midnight when some people could still be awake and, awake and watching TV. It's really um, later. <laughs> um, so here, what you see here is again, um, basically no difference, same pattern. Um, then we decided to go slightly deeper. Um, we're thinking, what if um, 
um, the kind of winter we had in Massachusetts this, um, this past season was the problem. The winter was really mild for those of you who come from, um, from our, our neck of woods. <laughs> um, so what we, and we were afraid that the temperature in the apartment was, um, was high, not because people didn't use the side bag, but because the outside temperature was so high. So to go around this, um, we decided to focus on the coldest nights of the heating season. So we considered only the nights when temperature fell below freezing point, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, which came down to 22 nights after January 12th when we reached full, complete deployment of the thermostats. And what we did, we calculated the average temperature for each apartment between midnight and 4 a.m., as Kurt mentioned, and we averaged for 22 cold nights. So here's what we found. Um, here you can see what temperatures the majority of apartments had on the coldest nights. And again, uh, those were not necessarily default energy uh, temperature, default uh, setting temperatures. There were only two apartments, if you look at it, um, because each one of those like smallest, shortest graphs represent one apartment, um, that were below default, so to say. Yeah? Um, the majority of them were definitely way, way above the uh, low default temperature. There were still two apartments that were relatively close at 64 and 65 degrees. And they do happen to belong to Vision, Vision Pro. But um, I would be very hesitant to draw any significant conclusions from that because it's compared to the rest of the sample, this is very small. So um, just to summarize here, um, the average night temperatures across 22 cold nights were 71.6 degrees for basic button thermostat, 71.2 for Vision Pro. Standard deviation was also relatively similar there. So, and we decided to look at what was the temperature before the nighttime setback. Did they lower it at all? At all? Was there any significant difference between um, the temperature at night and the temperature in the evening when people like to have it warm and cozy? Well, it's relatively small. It's about one degree. So um, this is just um, like what I mentioned, the first initial analysis that we have been doing, and we have a huge amount of data. Uh, we still have the sensors installed uh, for the cooling season. Um, so some of the data that's going to be coming out um, this summer and fall um, are percentages of households in each condition that use daytime setbacks, that use at least some kind of program uh, overrides of default settings and the temperature preferred, um, a permanent hold function and for how long it was used. So those are all kind of the behavioral components regarding the use of thermostats that, that matter. What we're also going to do is we're going to look at the relationship between self-report data and the sensor-based data. That's a very interesting question because if you find that self-report is very close and good approximation, well, why should we do the complicated sensors in the future? <laughs> Uh, but if not, then uh, we'll know what the relationship is. Uh, we're going to also look at the satisfaction of the thermostats, the people like them. I mean, from just kind of um, informal interaction with the residents, it's not like they just like them, and they definitely, yeah, they were positive, <laughs> I would say. Um, another set of factors we're going to plug in into this data are the building physics characteristics. We have a whole building enclosure, building simulation, um, building performance simulation um, people we're going to look at the R value of the walls, um, insulation types, all of that, uh, and see how that could potentially influence our results. And even more importantly, once we have the pattern for um, occupant behavior regarding thermostats, we could use that pattern to, um, to make building performance models more precise. Because right now, what they assume, they assume uh, occupants that are on their best behavior, so to say. And that, of course, overestimates the savings to a large degree uh, that are predicted by these models. And if we take the average behavior, um, the assumption will be that it's, it's more accurate. Um, again, the caveats, this is a specific type of a building. This is affordable housing uh, in Boston. So um, potentially future tests should kind of expand that. So this is a very specific case. I just didn't want, and this is preliminary data. We just got it basically last week. Um, <laughs> So now, um, uh, what I would like to talk about is um, the what does it all mean part. Um, so we are thinking that there's a behavior change model that's particularly relevant and kind of useful in predicting the results and explaining our results. 
Uh, it's a fog behavior change model um, that postulates that there are three factors that underlie behavior change. And we talked about some of those factors here extensively previously, one of them being motivation, uh, the other one ability, the third one is the trigger. So, and what that model predicts is that for any behavior to take place, all three of those components have to come together at the same time. So, um, so if your, say, telephone rings and it's a trigger for the behavior, uh, you're not gonna pick it up if you're in the shower and you're not gonna pick it up if you don't want to talk to the person who's there. So if you don't have the ability and you don't have the motivation, the trigger is not gonna work. And also, so basically, each one of those components is very, very important. Um, so what we think happened in our um, thermostat case, um, ability um, presumably increased. People could potentially program the thermostats. Um, however, we don't know anything about their motivation level. If you assume from the average, there probably wasn't much of a motivation level and there wasn't a trigger. And to make things even more complicated, what we're talking about there are two very different behaviors. The first behavior is active programming, which they didn't have to do because they received the thermostats that are already programmed for energy saving. So, but assuming that, didn't, that wasn't the case, so you'd want to have them motivated to program it, you'd want to make it easy for them to program it, you're going to push them in some way, say, so here, you go now and program it. So that would be what, what ha would happen if it was just an average thermostat that was there regardless of the setting. But in our case, we want them to not kind of use it. So they, they, they were set for the, for the um, energy saving behavior. So what you want to do, they actually want to remove all of those things. You want to remove the ability, you want to remove, you want to turn the motivation upside down, so to say, and, um, and get rid of the triggers. Uh, and the triggers in that case being maybe it gets too cold or whatever. So this, this could be any, any one factor. So, um, so we have one device, but um, it, its effectiveness depends on two opposing behaviors. And it's pretty difficult to get it to address both of those equally effectively. Um, so I guess that's where um, I'll stop the discussing of the, of the model and go back to our um, initial question. So are people with a high usability thermostat more likely to use energy saving settings? No. Um, not unless they're motivated and triggered or unless um, um, it's programmed and uh, they don't have any ability to change it and, and don't have any have motivation not to change it and nothing triggers them to, change, to go and push that button to go up. Um, so what do we do next? Well, I would suggest we work on the missing components, motivation, triggers, um, or we work on the technology that's going to replace the motivation triggers and make it easier. So we have a lot of work cut out for us. Thank you. Thank you.